what I watched through this pandemic is some people even now are still paralyzed. They're very stuck. And some people immediately kind of ran towards the sound of the gunfire. And so, you know, but mindset isn't something that you check a box and you finish. It's something you've got to condition every day. Hi, welcome to the Tarun Stevenson Leadership Channel. I'm your host, Tarun Stevenson, and we are all about helping you lead, communicate, and grow to your full potential. Whether you're tuning in on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite podcasting app, don't forget to subscribe and follow so that you can stay up to date with all our latest episodes. All right, here's the latest episode. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, Tarun here. I'm here with keynote speaker and business strategist, Meredith Elliott Powell. She's been named one of the top 15 business growth experts to watch, one of the 41 motivational speakers. She has a arsenal of books to her credit and we're going to talk to her about her latest book, Thrive. Welcome Meredith to the show. Thank you, Tarun. I am, uh, I am excited to be here. Uh, so good to have you on. I've just been going through some of your material and looking over your work. You've got an exceptional body of work on thriving as a business owner and as a leader. And so I know that our listeners are going to get a great deal out of what you have to share today. I was intrigued by the title of your upcoming book, Thrive. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could just tell us a story about how you came up with the concept of this book, because it really started before everything happened in 2020. You had no idea there was a pandemic coming. This is not an opportunity, opportunistic book. You were just writing uh, about something you thought was important. And as it happened, this year just needs your message so much. Why don't you tell us that story? Yeah, I certainly did not see the uh, did not see the pandemic um, coming. You know, really, my um, my obsession with how to survive in a, in a new marketplace began back in two thousand eight, and we all kind of remember two thousand eight. Yeah. It's when the world hit what seems now like a minimal blip. Right. Yeah, um, right. But I, I wrote a book uh, that came out in 2010 called Winning in the Trust and Value Economy about the economic shift that we all went through through 2008. And after that book, I sort of became obsessed with the word uncertainty, because really mm. from about 2010 to now, our economy was booming. Things were going yeah. great, no matter where you went in the world. And so when I want to talk to business owners and leaders and say, how are things going? Everybody answered the same. They would say, things are good. Things are great. Things couldn't be better. We're probably going to have our best year on record, but yeah. oh, this uncertainty. As if uncertainty always had to be a negative, always yeah. had to be a bad thing. And that just got me thinking, what if we flip the script on that? What if we started to think about uncertainty as not only not a negative, but a positive? What if uncertainty could be the thing that didn't stop your business from growing, but actually propelled it forward? What if uncertainty was the catalyst you needed to transform the business? And from that, uh, I started researching and the, uh, the book and the whole new platform was born. And that all started in 2018 the book comes out this fall and it turns out that the research I did on the companies, they not only survived economic downturn, yeah. but these companies have come through a pandemic. So it's a methodology of how to survive, not how to survive, really how to thrive no matter what. I love it. I love it. I, look, I remember 2008 very well. And I, I know that many people were just in the last three years talking about how we've just recovered from 2008 for many businesses yeah. and many economies. It took them a long time to get over that. And uh, I think if anything, this year has shown us is how tenuous our grasp on certainty really is. It's so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I myself uh, in my business, the first quarter of this year was my best quarter ever. And it was just like, I was on high. I was just like, this is going to be the greatest year ever. And literally within the space of a couple of weeks, it was actually the, the last week I was on a 18 workshop tour. 
in Australia and I landed in my home city of Brisbane. And as I was walking up the, the gangway, I saw all these planes being parked and a number of planes that I'd never seen before. And I thought something's going on. There's the, this is not going to be a short term uh, lockdown. And, you know, just uh, the, the months that followed that just showed us how quickly thing can turn around. But I love the way that you say that your attitude towards uncertainty can actually become the catalyst for our growth. Why don't you talk to us more about what that looks like for maybe say a mindset? I'm guessing that starts with your attitude before you do anything strategic, uh, how you approach uncertainty with the right frame of mind. Yeah, you know, it's such an interesting subject, right? Because part of me has been living through this pandemic with everybody else. The other is I'm just fascinated by human nature and how we react to it. And what I've noticed is that um, mindset is the very first thing. And yeah. I've got to admit, when I was coming up, I'm a person of action. I move. And I always thought mindset, what a bunch of fluff, who's got time for that? But, um, but it is the most critical piece because what I watched through this pandemic is some people even now are still paralyzed. They're yeah. very stuck. And some people immediately kind of ran towards the sound of the gunfire. Yeah. And so, you know, but mindset isn't something that you check a box and you finish. It's something you've got to condition every day. I mean, first you've got to choose it, right? You've got to decide I'm going to come through this pandemic, but I don't care who you are, anxiety, fear, worry, it creeps into all of our thought processes. And if you're not doing something to strengthen your mindset, and I tell people it's your personal choice, whether it's Mm. meditation, whether it's prayer, whether it's just time alone, whether it's journaling, whether it's reading your vision, whatever it is, the people that I'm finding that are really coming through this pandemic have a practice around mindset. They do something every day to decide what their mindset is going to be and how to position their mindset. Absolutely. And I think that's such a great reminder is that you don't have to be totally free of fear or free of worry. I mean, that's a normal human trait and we all go through it. It's the ability to master it and to manage it as you process. And I really have been fascinated too about watching the different types of people and how they respond. Even, even at very high political levels, it's been fascinating to watch world leaders, how some world leaders have handled this uh, pandemic with such grace and poise, while other world leaders have seemed to catastrophize or fall apart under pressure. And I think it just goes to show that Really, if you're not in control of your own emotions, it doesn't matter how powerful you are or how experienced you are as a leader, it really becomes the thing that uh, causes you to become unstuck. Yeah, I, I so agree. You said something so important there, and that is that, um, that it, it, you know, to, to acknowledge the fact that you have fears and worries. Yeah. I mean, when I work with, uh, when I work with my clients, um, I always say we need to articulate what you're concerned about. We need to articulate your biggest fear because until you get it out, it, it festers inside you. It's, yeah. you know, they, um, they did a study here in the um, U S on the Vietnam war and prisoners of war from the, um, from the Vietnam war and who survived and who didn't. And I mean, unthinkable conditions and the ones who survived were not the optimists. They were not the pessimists. They were the realists. Wow. And what a realist does. And I think it's so important for us to be realists is that you accept your reality. You accept the fact that you don't paint it with a rosy picture, like everything's going to be great and I can come through this fine. And then you're not so negative. You suck the life out of everything. Mm. You just look at your surroundings and you say, look, this is bad. I'm worried about cash flow. I'm worried about this. But the moment you articulate that and get it out, then you can say, what can I control and what I can't control? And the difference between people who succeed and people who don't is they focus on what they can control. They acknowledge what they can't, but they focus their time and their energy on what they can control. Yeah, that's so good. You know, just mm-hmm. focus, the, the ability to focus on what you can control. I, I work in an industry where I'm working with teachers a lot. 
And one of the challenges with teaching is you're working with unpredictability in children yeah. and, uh, you know, just reminding them. That's one of the things that I always have to talk to them. What are the things that you can control? You can't control the way other people treat you. You can't control the attitudes that other people bring into the relationships that you have, but you can control your own responses. You can control the way that you, uh, see the world and, you know, something simple as turning off the news. If it causes you stress yeah. or it causes you anxiety, turn that television off, switch off the Facebook and focus on the things that you can manage and can control. So as a leader and a business owner, um, once you acknowledge the realities of what's going on, what, what do you suggest are the steps forward? So that, cause I really have this conviction, I'm a bit of a student of history and yeah. I don't think what we're seeing now is anything new. We, mm -hmm. If you look at history, we've seen things like this before. And there are people that survived pandemics and there are people that survived economic downturns in the past. And I think there will be people that come out on top through this as well. Uh, what are the steps that you think a successful leader takes during a crisis to actually set them up for the next uh, big opportunity. Yeah, well, interesting you would say that. So when I wrote the book, what I did was I identified um, nine companies that have been around since the late 1700s, early 1800s, and right. they're still in business today. They're still thriving today. So I did exactly what you said. I learned from history. Right. And basically, I've got a nine-step methodology that I'll just give you a couple, um, a couple of the steps, right. some of my favorite steps. Um, number one is you've got to condition yourself for change. Um, one of the most interesting things I think about change is that most of the work that we do around change is accepting change once change shows up. Mm. And it's too late when change shows up. If you see change coming, it can be your greatest opportunity. If you wait for it, it will flatten you, bury you, or at least make you unproductive. Mm. So one of the biggest things I saw was that these companies anticipated change meaning that they took time out of their business, at least on a monthly basis, if not a quarterly basis, just got their team together and thought about the changes they see coming in the marketplace. We are now living in a time where the majority of the change that will impact our ability to be successful is outside of our company. It's yeah. changes in society, economics, politics, technology, your industry, um, competition. And you've got to ask yourself, are you spending time thinking about the changes that are coming? And so I always say change is like a muscle. The more you work it, the more you think about it, the more you anticipate it, the stronger you're going to be. And if you think, if you talk about those changes, you'll be one step ahead. And you can see with these companies, they didn't wait for war to show up. They didn't wait for economic downturn. They were always one step ahead and they would see the shifts coming in the marketplace and develop products and services that would be relevant. So that's one of my favorites. And in the books, I've got a tool around how to do that. Great. I love it. And change, I think, is often portrayed as very negative. Yeah. And, uh, yeah different, I think personalities and personality types resist change more than others. But mm -hmm. I... I've always found that change happens whether we like it or not. And in fact, all of us love change to some degree. We change our cars, we change our clothes, we change our food. Um, it's, it's more just an attitude around when change comes and we don't feel like we're in control of that yeah. change, when perhaps somebody else is controlling the change or perhaps it's out of the control of anybody that seems to uh, conjure up a fear of change in people that can be quite paralyzing. What, what do you do if you're that kind of personality where uh, change tends to overwhelm you rather than uh, elicit a sense of opportunity? Yeah, well, the first thing I say is that if change overwhelms you, first of all, we all love change, change that we feel in control of. You're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, I, I think I'm somebody who loves change. And then I realize I only like it if it's my idea. Yeah. And um, if change overwhelms you, that is a red flag that you are waiting for change to happen. Yeah. 
So the tool that I give people is called a skeptic. It's a simple set of words, society, competition, economics, politics, technology, industry, and customers. And if you could just spend 30 minutes a month talking about the changes that you see happening, you're going to wind up in the power seat as to it relates to change. You're going to... Um, see change coming. And if you mm. see change coming, then you have time to plan for it. It won't right. overwhelm you. You can choose the changes that you need to respond to. We panic with change because we're always reacting to change. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to, we need to flip that around and we need to get into a, into a seat where we're driving change, not allowing change to drive us. Yeah. I, I found in my life that when I, um, anticipate change and try to respond rather than react opportunities seem to follow or seem to open up have have you found that that's the case when when you don't wait for change but you just step out anticipating change that the opportunities that you may not have at the moment actually seem to unfold as you step towards them yeah completely it is um it is you become strategic around change. You become in a point where if you want to gain competitive advantage um, over others in your marketplace, start to see change before change happens because everybody, I don't know if it's human nature or whatever, but we wait for change. And we think we're really good if we adapt to change quickly once it gets Mm, there. mm. That's not the name of the game. The name of the game is to be changing before you have to change. Yeah. Absolutely. I love the story of Corning where I know when I was growing up, my mum had this glass cookware Corning ware and it was very desirable. Yeah. And, you know, in the late seventies, I, I believe that they, um, the executives got together and said, okay, what's something that we can do with the existing infrastructure to actually anticipate future growth. And it wasn't that they were struggling. They weren't in a bad financial position. They just felt the need to anticipate yeah. and they looked into fiber optic cable. They're now the largest manufacturer of fiber optic cable and also the manufacturer of the glass uh, screens on most iPhones and things like that. So, you know, this queer company anticipated the future and they now dominate that space with glassware. And I think that's just a beautiful example of what you're talking about there. That's um, yeah, that's a, that's a great example. One of my favorite stories from the book uh, is with Brooks brothers. Um, You know, Brooks brothers started out making men's suits and uh, they started out in the, um, in the early 1800s, but by, uh, by about um, 1860, they saw things begin to change and they saw the beginning of the civil war uh, here in the U S and they were one of the first to go to, um, to go to get the contracts to go from making men's suits to making, um, um, to making, uh, uh, you know, uniforms. Yeah. And everybody said, that's silly. You know, this, this war isn't going to last but a couple of months. Well, and it ended up lasting over four years. And that completely carried them through. And so it is about really paying attention to and sensing what's happening around you mm-hmm. so that, um, you know, you also lead into another great step. I love that story with, um, with Corning because mm-hmm. the other, one of the most fascinating steps that I found when researching the book is that companies were not married to the product they made. They yeah. were married to the values of who they were. Yeah. And one of the most difficult things to do is to figure out how to make decisions in an uncertain mm-hmm. marketplace because nobody knows what's going to happen. It cracks me up every time I watch, mm-hmm. I watch the news. We're on a V-shaped recovery. We're on a W-shaped recovery. This pandemic's coming back. It's going away. I mean, nobody has any idea what's going to happen. So the way that companies have survived is they've backed up and they've really been clear on their core values, decided who they wanted to be during this pandemic and who they wanted to be after this pandemic, and then use those core values as a litmus test. So your example of Corning is so great. They weren't married to the product. Mm. They were just married to the values of who they were wanting to be relevant and innovative in the marketplace. And that has carried them through. And, um, and I think far too often we're so concerned or so driven by the product we produce yeah. and you got to let go of that. Your company is a culture. It's a set of values. And if you hold true to those, it's going to allow you to be open to the opportunities in the marketplace. I'm so glad you said that because I I think so often what happens is, and I know this happened with me when I was younger as well. I, I married what I did with who I was 
And yeah. I, I could separate the two. And if I wasn't, so in my twenties, I was a musician. And if I wasn't uh, singing and performing, I wasn't fulfilling my purpose. And it wasn't till much later that I realized my purpose could be enacted in so many different ways, even if I wasn't singing. And I see that with businesses as well, especially small, small to medium enterprise. Very often they start off very narrow and very focused and don't realize that they can fulfill their purpose far beyond how they started, that it's not just about what they do, but who they are as yeah. uh, with their values and mission. How, how do you identify that? Or maybe how do you separate that out? Uh, if, if say a listener is, or a leader is just thinking, well, I, that's how I think. How do we tease out the difference between uh, who we are and what we do and, and make it work for us? Yeah, you know, I think that um, I think that really spending time. I, I mean, I honestly, um, I honestly think that your values personally and professionally need to align. I mean, I'm old enough that I grew up in a world where your personal life was your personal life and your business life was your business life, and I just don't think that's true. I mean, I think that if I am, uh, if I am. Uh, customer focused, I put my customers first in my business life, then I have to be somebody who puts the people who are important to me in my life, in my personal life, with my personal life. So I think the first thing a leader really needs to do is sit down and figure out their own personal values. And the thing about values is most of us, if I asked you what's most important in your life, you'll tell me it's your family, it's your kids, it's your health. It's, but you got to ask yourself, are you living that way? And yeah. most often that is, that is not aligned. So I think it's figuring out your personal values and then, and then figuring out what you want your company to stand for, what you want the guiding pr principles and the promises of your company to be. Mm. And then you've got to hold yourself accountable to live those. You've got to, you've got to reflect at least quarterly and say, are we aligning to our values? And when decisions come in front of you, does it, does it move you closer to your values or away? I mean, one of my values, I got way out of whack for a long time at the beginning of the career was my family. They seemed to always come last because I was trying to grow a business. And uh, when I became a keynote speaker, I just traveled so much. I was never home. So I had to start making decisions based on when opportunities came in front of me. Does this align with who I am and who I want to be or doesn't it? And it really it was, again, I can't say enough, a litmus test to help me understand um, just saying your values and living your values are two totally different things. Yeah, that's so good. And I, I think so often for, for leaders, because we are driven to achieve our dreams or achieve the goals that we set for ourselves, we, we can realize too late that it comes at the expense of the things that are most important. Most I, I like a post that you recently put up I think it was on Facebook where you talked about, I don't want to uh, come to the end of my life and wonder what I should do with my life. You know, you wanted to keep talk about keeping that balance between what's really important and what you do. Talk yeah. more about that from a, a, a family perspective, because I think that's probably the area I see most often with leaders is the, the people that are sacrificed in our pursuit of our dreams are often, you know, our spouses, our children, the ones that care for us most. Yeah. How, how has that journey been for you? What have you done in your life to align uh, yourself uh, with those things that are important? Yeah. Well, first of all, I did everything wrong. <laughs> Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, if you did, if you'd met me in my twenties and thirties, uh, I just put my family completely on the back burner and everything was about, um, driving, uh, the business. Here's the challenge with that is that what you when you're out of alignment with your values, you put a lot of stress on yourself. So you not only hurt your family and things like that, but it's stressful because when we are out of alignment, we're. I, there was always guilt running through me, um, yes. guilt that I should be with my family, guilt that I should be at work, guilt, you know, this type of thing. Mm. So it wasn't until I started doing the work around, um, and I started this in my early um, 30s, I'm 57 years old right now. So I've been at this for 20 years, over 20 years. But if you got up with me every morning, what you would see is the fact that I grab a cup of coffee, I come upstairs, I get in front of my computer, I get up before anybody else in my family uh, does. And I 
sit down and I meditate for 15 minutes and then I read my values. I read my missions, my goals. And so it's, um, it's right here. They're right here on note cards. Yeah. And, um, and I basically, I remind myself every morning of what I want to focus on that day. And if you read those, you'll see they're a mix of my family, hmm. mix of my health. They're a mix of my business and they're a mix of the contribution that I want to make in, in my community. And so I just really feel like for me to set my mind right around that just focuses me correctly during the day. Yeah. So you so, see now, if you follow me, I mean, it's definitely a priority. Uh, you know, the moment that my husband gets up, I stop what I'm doing and we yeah. have breakfast together. I make time every day for my health. There's time to work, but it's, it's just the balance of all of those. But if I didn't remind myself first thing in the morning, I don't believe that would happen. Yeah, that's so good. And it's so good that you have that practice of reminding yourself every day. You know, we talk in business about mission drift and, and companies yeah. can drift away from the mission. I, I think, like you say, we can actually have individual drift from our mission and our vision as well. And just that need to come back and, and ground yourself in the things that are important on a daily basis is so crucial. Um, how, how do you approach when we're going through a pandemic right now and, and there's a lot of leaders out there and there's a lot of business owners out there that are, are really trying to, you know, they're trying to anticipate what to do next. And they're trying to come out of this with, you know, uh, some sense of um, responsiveness rather than reactiveness. How do we manage our tendency to what well, no sorry let me rephrase this how do we manage the prolonged uh weight because some of this is a weight game that is beyond our control uh you know with lockdowns much of it's controlled by what government deciding or what health directives are and there are other factors at work that may be preventing us from launching in this new direction that we're ready to launch in mm -hmm. uh, how do you manage the waiting period because i think waiting is such a uh essential part of growth and is such an essential part of coming out well but waiting's hard it's yeah. it's hard to be patient when you're ready to go what what do you say to that um, there's a couple of things. Um, number one is I, I really want to, I, I want any listener to back up and think about writing down, um, uh, what you can control and what you can't control. Yeah. And the waiting is something you can't control. So that goes into that bucket and focusing very strongly on the things that you can control. The second is that um, you've got to use this time to figure out how you are going to emerge successful from this crisis. And what I do is I, and I encourage my clients to do something called secure your base. And so it's so easy in this business to get focused, hyper-focused on trying to grab any business you can get, right? Mm -hmm. Anything you need to stay afloat. Well, what I, what I researched and what I tell people to do is to focus on your existing customers. Go back four to five years of right. anybody that you've done business with. And I want you to reach out and I want you to have a conversation with them. Right. Now, a couple of things are going to happen from that conversation. Number one is those customers are going to be incredibly loyal mm -hmm. to you because you reached out. The second is this is your opportunity to do research. Because Tara, in the moment that I ask you, how are things going? How, you know, how is your industry doing? What's going on with your business? And I listen, I'm going to hear your challenges. I'm going to hear your opportunities. I'm going to hear the ways that I need to change my products and services to be more relevant and more valuable in this marketplace. And, um, and that's where, that's one of the biggest mistakes I see businesses making right now is they're trying to sell the same products or services that they sold in the first quarter of this year. Yeah. And your customers don't have the same problems. They don't have the same challenges. Things have changed for them and you need to change your offerings. So use this time wisely mm. to better understand your target market so that you can shift the products or services you sell, or at least change the messaging so that they solve the problem. Cause you're not going to, you, people don't buy from you because they understand your product or service. Yeah. They buy from you because they feel you are selling a product that understands them that solves their problem. 
Yeah, it's so good. And I, I had a recent experience like that uh, with my business. Uh, I run training seminars for school teachers, and I've got a lot of school teachers that are writing to me saying, when are you back on the road? When are your workshops happening? And I got to thinking, I thought, okay, well, there's demand there, but are they actually going to be able to come? Because there's, yeah. a, sec there's a second person in that equation, the school administration, they're the ones that decide if you can come to the workshop. And so I wrote to the principals that I have in my list and I said, are you guys ready for live workshops yet? And almost all of them said, no, we're not sending mm -hmm. any teachers out to live workshops. And so you see that just, just that simple question of, uh, okay, maybe the teachers were ready but the administration are not ready. And I would have uh, probably jumped the gun if I'd uh, launched and advertised a, a series of workshops uh, because they weren't able to come. Uh, so that's, yeah. that's great advice right there. So, so what do we, um, what do you predict for the rest of 2020? Uh, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because we're, we're talking yeah. about unpredictability and how do you see, um, 2020 playing out. Brene Brown talks about um, the new normal. You know, we, we're not going to go back to the way things were. Many of the things, the way that we operated previously was dysfunctional anyway. And so it's good that we've put them to bed. How do you see businesses that are successful and coming out of this? How do you see them being different to the way they were before pandemic, before the kinds of crises we're dealing with now? Yeah. Um, you know, a couple of things. Um, number one is, I mean, I, I believe th through to my bones that nobody has any idea what's going to happen or how this is going to shake out. I mean, there's this constant pull between the fact that, yeah, there are definitely some things that have changed, but at the end of the day, we're human beings and we love to connect and we miss one another. You know, I was watching something on the news this morning that talked about young people and remote working. And you think that they would be the group that would just love it. But even they're saying, no, 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 we, you know, we need to see people. I, I need feedback live. So yeah. my first thing is that to, to understand, I don't care what expert you're listening to, including me right now, we don't flipping have a clue. No. So the things that I think um, make companies successful is, um, is number one is they are not married to the way that they are doing things. They're going to be very, very open to yeah. change their delivery methods, what they sell and, and what they do, and really pay attention to what's happening um, in the marketplace. The second is I think that they are going to become even tighter and even closer to their existing customers. Um, and they're going to constantly shift what they're doing to be more relevant um, to really be aware of the problems uh, that, um, that people are, are facing. But you know, the rest of me, like right now, if you ask me for the rest of 2020, I believe that we're going to stay virtual. I mean, I think that we're going to social distance through the end of the year. You're doing better than we are in Australia and the U.S. We're, uh, you know, we're ticking back up. So, um, but, you know, the one thing I've learned is March seems like a whole different world to me than, than July does. So I don't know what September is going to bring. So, um, so really having that, having that investment and in staying close and, um, and being open. And are you so conditioned for change that if you need to change on a dime, you can. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that ability to change within change, I was listening to Karen Newhoff. He's a leadership uh, expert who works in the faith community space a lot. And he, he, he's talking about, you know, a lot of churches are trying to go back and back to normal services, but then some of them are realizing that it may be too soon and they have to yeah. wind back those plans. And so even if you're anticipating getting back to work, you may find that you have to dial that back because we don't really know what's coming up around the corner we don't yeah and and i and i do think are you exploring new and um and different ways for people to 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 interact with you just because you get told no that you know something doesn't work are you finding the work around and are you are you being um innovative for that one of my favorite things about this pandemic is the creativity of business you know if i go to a restaurant here in the u.s i mean I just love the fact of, you know, the way they've turned their parking lots into, yeah. into, you know, into a place where, um, where I can eat the lengths that they've gone to, to make me, um, you know, feel safe and still, yes. still have a good time. So yeah. be creative. Don't take anything off the table. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably one of my favorite things is looking at 
businesses that have innovated and just been out of the box thinking and they've managed to find ways to survive and thrive through this pandemic, which has been good. Do you, you, you mentioned something about uh, becoming more married to our base. Uh, do you think the whole concept of globalization is going to take a shift? I, I think in Australia, I've noticed that people are a lot more focused on shopping local, supporting local. Uh, are you seeing that in the US? Do you think that that's something that businesses could should consider, you know, focusing small rather than focusing wide? Yeah, you know, it's um, number one is I think we all want to help our community survive, right? So we're trying to be conscious of that and help that. Um, but I still, you know, one of the most amazing things to me about my business right now is that it's um, where I used to have to get on a plane to serve people globally. I no longer have to do that, you know, so, so a lot. Um, yes, yeah, so I watch my connections on LinkedIn and they're, mm. they're, um, they're far more global. Like do, I think, I don't know that, I, I certainly don't think globalization is gone. I think there will be mindful. I mean, there's certainly going to be countries that we run to that we want to engage with and, and those that we're more um, cautious about. But at the end of the day, people are people and we want to engage and we want to connect. So as much as I'm trying very hard to support my own community, I am finding that now all of a sudden, if I want to take a class that's offered in Korea, mm. it's so easy for me to do, right? Because yeah. everything is virtually, if I want to attend a conference in Europe, I can do it, you know, yeah. because Australia used to be such a commitment for me. But now if I want to speak in Australia, I can do that. So I don't know. I think it's, um, you know, I think it's, I, I think it's going to be a beautiful blend of all of it. I love the fact that we're, we're more focused locally than we've been, because mm. I think it's mm. good for us all to invest in our communities. At the yeah. same time, we're a global world. And one of my favorite things is doing something like we are right now, where I get to reach your audience and talk with yeah. your audience. So that's Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things that I, I love about um, what's happened now is it's forced us to, to do things that perhaps we didn't do before. I mean, I started this podcast in March. I've been talking about a podcast for two years yeah. and I just thought, you know what, now's the time. And I just started reaching out to people and, and I, I just love the fact that I can have great meaningful conversations with somebody on the other side of the world and, and we can learn together and we can grow together. And, and so that aspect of it has just been just wonderful. I love it. Yeah. Fantastic. So, well, tell us more about uh, your book. It's, it's launching uh, when in end of July, is that right? It's actually going to launch uh, the 1st of September okay. and you can, yeah, and you can find um, all about it uh, on, on uh, my website, which is just the terms value and speaker.com value speaker.com. And my whole website is really devoted to so much um, about the book. I've got a quiz right. there you can take, which will determine your thrive uh, indicator. I've got a uh, purple bar at the top of my site called Emerge Successful, which is full of free tools and resources, all coming from the book on how to thrive um, in, in, uh, in an uncertain um, marketplace. And you can see the companies that I, uh, that I researched and get some of those strategies to get you started. I love it. So good. We will put the link in the description and uh, I'm looking forward to that coming out. I think I'm going to find that a fascinating read. I love history and I love reading about people innovating. So uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Is there anything else that you would like to tell us about with what you're doing and the work that you're doing at the moment, Meredith? Well, I think that, you know, really the, um, the last thing that I'll say that I think is so incredibly imp important, we've alluded a bit to it, but that's that you've got to shed fast and, um, and keep moving, is that the, um, the world is not the same as it was in March. Um, by November of this year, it will be very different, and who yeah. knows what 2021 um, holds. So just because it worked for you in April of this year does not mean that it's going to work in uh, March. I do some work with a company in the airline industry, mm. and we had a really strong contingency plan in place, which really carried them through the first couple of months. But we've updated that plan 21 times since this wow. pandemic has hit, wow. because um, you've got to be able to shed fast and keep moving. So that would really be my um, my last piece. The other is um, I'm a big believer. If you build your network, you change your life. Yeah. Uh, I believe connections are everything. So if we are not connected, I would love to be connected. Great. And how can people connect with you, Meredith? 
The best way is on my website, valuespeaker.com. Um, but again, I tend to live on uh, LinkedIn okay. uh, and all the social networking um, sites. So you can pick me up uh, anywhere there. And if you reach out to me, I will definitely respond. Wonderful. And uh, we will definitely put the links to your uh, social media platforms and website in our description. Meredith Elliott Powell, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Your insights have been so timely and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the show and a great conversation. Thank you. It really has been. Until next time. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you got a ton of value out of that episode. Don't forget to let us know what you thought in the comments. And if you have a topic you'd like us to cover next time, we'd love to hear from you. If you know anyone that would benefit from the content that we produce, please like and share this channel. And we look forward to having you next time on the Tarun Stevenson Leadership Channel. 